Friends, let's join now together in our opening prayer. Creator of all, we praise and worship you with hearts full of rejoicing. Your amazing love for us is unfathomable. We feel it in the breeze. We see it in the faces of our loved ones. We hear it in the music all around us. There is no one like you. You are the great and mighty God of all, worthy of our adoration and praise. You created us for yourself so that our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. Inspire us and motivate us to be bearers of your good news and hope. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And please be seated. So I'm happy to report that over 15 of us had a wonderful time at John Street United Methodist Church last Sunday afternoon. We had a great experience with Reverend Jason Rodmacher giving us a tour, a talk about early Methodism. Uh, we saw the items in the Methodist Museum, and even a clock that John Wesley himself donated to the John Street Church. It was quite something. And uh, we will probably form another group to go in the future for those of you who didn't get a chance and might like to. It was really wonderful. So I want to thank everybody who jumped on board and, and came on down and went to John Street. And some of the stories that we heard will find their way into upcoming sermons, I'm sure. So you'll get to hear some more stories, too. Today is the district conference at Salem United Methodist Church in the city, and our lay leader Bruce is going down by train today. So if anybody would like to go with him, it's a three o'clock conference with pastors and lady from all over our district, election of officers, worship, and celebrations. So feel free to talk to Bruce for more information if you're interested. And Sue Gill spoke last week about health kits for annual conference for our New York and Connecticut region. And so now you have a list in your bulletin of items that we're collecting for these health kits. We will be sending out an announcement about which Sunday we'll be putting them together in an assembly line fashion. So start to gather those items. They are used for people in emergency situations. So it's a wonderful way to help. The conference as a whole collects so many health kits. It's really a great ministry. And today is the so-and-so's spring sale, which you probably noticed on your way in. So if you go in the lower church parlor afterward for coffee hour, hosted uh, by the Leopolds, you'll be going in there and having some lovely things you can look at, maybe even a Mother's Day gift, or just something to spruce up your home for spring. Our rummage sale is coming up on June 4th. So I hope you're starting to think about items you might like to donate for that or whether you can donate your time on that Saturday. So there's information there about the shifts and about who to speak to if you're interested. And there are a few other things that you can look over on your own and the announcements of other opportunities happening. So that's our announcements for the day. Oh, and Robin. Thank you, Robin. Come on up. Meant to call on Robin. Thank you, Robin. Um, one thing, a couple little things to go quickly. Uh, on the 7th of May, there's going to be a hike for hope. It's a hike to fight suicide. And it's going to be up in Yorktown in the Pavilion parking lot. So I left some posters like this on the coffee table so you can get more information. Or if you, indeed, if you want to talk to me about it, that's great. Um, next Sunday is Mother's Day. And our kids, in honor of their moms, are going to be playing their, their handbells here in, in church. Um, so please be aware of that and get as many kids as you can to come. And any, any child can play handbells. It, it, this is very easy. It's, it's color-coded, but it is great experience for the kids. Um, also on Mother's Day, I don't have anybody to do coffee hour for Mother's Day. So if God... Oh, I got a volunteer. Oh, you are? Oh, great. Oh. Oh, wonderful. Oh, this is, okay, I'm out of here. <laughs> I should announce that I asked Robin if she'd be our hospitality coordinator and keep those coffee hour hosts flowing, and she great, gratefully accepted, and she's doing a great job already. So thanks, Robin. It's really nice.
16, verses 9 through 15. During the night, Paul had a vision. There stood a man of Macedonia pleading with him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Sumothras. The following day, to Neopolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river, where we were supposed, where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the woman who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatria and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. The second reading is from John chapter 14, verses 23 through 29. Jesus answered him, Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. Thus, the word of the Lord. Isn't it beautiful how God leads them to people of faith along the river who are praying? These are described as God worshipers. So they're not people who have come to believe that Christ was resurrected or understood about his life, but they were people who are worshiping God, people of faith. So their hearts were very ready to hear more about what God had been doing lately. And so, God knew to send them there at that moment. I like the detail in this passage that says, we sat down and began to talk with the women who had gathered. Not we called them over to where we were standing and proclaiming to them, but we sat down and talked with them. That's a beautiful image because it shows that they just humbly sat with them and had conversation. It was not a sermon, it was a conversation. But in that conversation, the Holy Spirit was moving. And so I think that's a really beautiful uh, example for us today, that we can keep in mind that every conversation we have through the day can be a holy moment where God's Spirit is moving. And perhaps someone is hearing just what they need to hear that day. That's a powerful thought, isn't it? Now, Lydia, the woman who's mentioned out of that group, actually came from Theatira, which is in modern-day Turkey. And it's interesting because before that, Paul and Silas and Timothy were kind of blocked by the Holy Spirit from going into that region. They were told, no, don't go there right now. But then, isn't it interesting how when God sent them to Philippi, they met someone from that area. So the beauty is that God knows how things are going to spread and how people's lives will be impacted. It's not always in a direct manner like we might think. It might happen very indirectly and circuitously. You might be talking to one person in the church. Something you say touches them and they talk to this next person that you never had a chance to talk to but that really needed to hear what you said. So God knows how to get the message that God needs out to whomever God needs to do it with. So it's beautiful to see how the Spirit worked there. Now it's also interesting, the kids sang about Zacchaeus and Jesus saying, I'm coming to your house today. And in this passage we have Lydia saying to Paul and Silas and Timothy, come to my house today. 
So she's so moved by the message that she wants them to come and baptize her and all of her household, and they do. They go and they stay with her. And then many scholars believe that Lydia then really started a house church, one of the first congregations. You know, we talked about John Street and its history, but look at this. This is one of the very earliest house churches. Lydia sharing her faith, others in her household sharing their faith. I'm sure telling their friends, come, come hear about why we were baptized and what we believe. And that was another way that the, the faith spread, was in their own home, the sharing in their own home. And today we, we find that happens in home Bible studies. I know you've had some home Bible studies here in this church. And that can be a place for those holy conversations to have and those life-changing conversations. So there's many ways it happens. Last week, after we went through the tour at John Street, it was such a beautiful night that I said, I'm going to walk around the city a little more, so I'm not heading home yet. And so I just started walking at about maybe 10 blocks north of John Street. I happened to overhear somebody sharing about the scriptures with someone else on the street. And again, not shouting, not doing it through a bullhorn or saying, do you know Jesus or you're going to hell? It wasn't like that at all. It was just a conversation. He was saying, well, it says that if we eat the flesh of the, and, and the blood of the Son of Man, that we will live. And he was just explaining a particular scripture, and the other man was looking at it, and they were having a little conversation just on the side of the sidewalk. And I thought, wow, if Wesley were here today, that's what he'd be doing. He wouldn't even be in the lovely building of John Street, which is lovely, but he would be out on the sidewalk talking to people, having conversation. I just know it. And so I thought that was a really neat kind of synchronicity afterward to, to hear somebody having conversation about Jesus on the street like that. So I think this text just reminds us if the Holy Spirit leads you to talk to someone, do it. It may not be directly about your faith. It might be about other topics. It might be just to get to know them. But over time, God can use that relationship to build faith. Some people even have a name for this. They call it friendship evangelism or relational evangelism. Well, that's well and good, but it shouldn't be done just because we think that that's what we're supposed to do. But it should just happen naturally as we have conversations with people that our faith comes up in some way because it's part of our daily lives. And it may not come, like I said, in a blunt way about you know what the Bible says, but it might even just be how God encouraged me this week, or how God helped a friend of mine, or what my faith means to me. It may come up more subtly. But I think the message of this passage is to remember that as we build relationships, we will build faith. Just not only by what we say, but by what we do, of course. But those conversations can play a really good role. So it says in the scripture, as she, Lydia, listened, the Lord enabled her to embrace Paul's message. And that's a really important point, too, because it's not us that has to convince somebody that Jesus lived, died, and rose again. That's God's job. Our job is only just to share the faith. It's just to, to enter into those relationships, and then God's the one who awakens faith in a human soul. And we read that in 1 Corinthians 3, 6 and 7. Paul wrote about this. He says, I planted the seed, Apollo watered it, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but God who gives the growth. So Paul had very early on in the church community, or the followers of the way, to have to say, look, it's not about me or Peter, or are you a follower of me or Peter, or which one baptized you, and it's not about that at all. We could translate that today to say it's not about which pastor, but it's God, it's the Holy Spirit at work in all. In the Discipleship Journal in 2004, a woman named Elizabeth Turnage wrote an article called Told Any Good Stories Lately? And she asked us to think about different kinds of stories that are important for us to share with others. And these are some of the categories, and I thought they were good. A tale of redemption. How have you seen God bring something beautiful out of a hard situation? Good thought. A tale of comfort. How have you experienced God's gentleness and shelter during a painful or difficult season? How has God comforted you? It might help somebody else who's looking for comfort, saying, well, if God did that for you, God could do that for me. A tale of victory. How has God helped you overcome a weakness? 
A tale of provision, describe a time when God met a pressing need. Or a tale of reconciliation, when have you witnessed God heal a relationship that seemed damaged beyond repair? And that's a really good one, because there are a lot of people out there with estrangements of one sort or another, or just tensions in relationships, and it's beautiful to hear testimonies of God healing relationships. Or even healing the heart if a relationship can't be mended, that's a beautiful testimony too, right? People who've gone through divorce and say, you know, I thought I'd never get through the pain, but God healed my heart, I'm fine. So that's good too. So those are just some good kind of prime the pump kinds of categories of the kinds of stories that we can share with each other. This past week, I am happy to say that I overcame a fear that had held me back for several years with God's help and prayers of many of you out there. I had been afraid of anesthesia to the point of not having a surgery or a test that could save my life. And I'd let this go on far too long. Well, finally I found a surgeon that wanted to do a two-step approach, a biopsy under anesthesia, and then a surgery. And I thought, well, okay, that sounds like a good way to overcome the fear. Do step one and then step two, rather than everything at once. And so I had my biopsy, and I said, wow, that anesthesia wasn't bad at all. I got some good rest and woke up. <laughs> I woke up and... The nurse said, hi, Karen, and then Ron walked in, hi, Karen, and then they gave me some cranberry juice, and I, gosh, I felt good all day, too. Whatever they gave me felt really good, so I now have empathy for drug addicts, too, because I really felt good, but, <laughs> so, oh dear, now I might be asking for more tests, you know, but, <laughs> yeah, but I, I can't tell you, I think I felt especially good though because I did what was scary for me because people were praying. There were some people out there I had told and they were all saying, well pray that everything goes well and that you're not scared and why that scared me I don't know. Maybe because when I was much younger I had a surgery that I found scary when I was much younger and I just have vague memories of it but I just didn't have a good experience. But all of us have different fears, right? All of us have different struggles and whatever it is, we want to pray with you about it. And that's the beauty. And then we have a testimony. The prayers helped. It went really well. Whatever it is. Or I did the thing that was so hard for me. And so now if I need to do the next thing, it won't be so hard. So that's the kind of story that we can share with each other. And it helps us connect and also share with people in the community. And it makes God so much more accessible than if we just say, this is what the Bible says. There's nothing wrong with that, but I think sharing how God works in our lives day to day has even more impact, or at least as part of what we share. So the other thing I would say, you know, in, in my experience is I think I've shared before that I've often found God working as a messenger, especially through people whose circumstances are really out of the box, like homeless and struggling for the next place to stay, sometimes people with mental illness, um, and, you know, a lot of times people shy away when somebody's life is a little different. And I've just found, though, that if I've talked to people in those situations, they're the ones that end up saying something that I needed to hear from God or praying for me and having great effect. So I want to encourage us as we listen for the leading of God, conversations that we should have. Remember, God may point you to people you didn't expect. And not just people that you know well either. It could be people you've never met that you just meet out there in the community and you're led to say something, even something simple, or give them a smile or just, you know, a friendly, a friendly look. Even that can make a difference. So building relationships and building faith go together. And so that's, I think the reason people are able to hear more about our faith once they know us a little bit, or we've made ourselves vulnerable or shared a little more, is because we have more credibility. If we're just sharing it out of the Bible or sharing from a book, people say, but I don't know you. How, why should I believe you? you know, but over time, when you get to know people, or if you do share those vulnerable stories, it helps. And so I want to encourage us to do that. I think I may have shared with you that one week Ron was talking to Phil and Rose and we found out that Phil and my father went to the same college for engineering. And now they're corresponding by email. Phil was kind enough to send my dad a great letter about the professors he liked and what it was like going to Drexel for engineering. And they were just like a class apart, but they were there at the same time, which is so amazing. 
And we also find that as we share our stories, we find those points of connection that we didn't even know we had. And God can work through those. I know, Phil, that your email to my dad will encourage him in this time in his life uh, and help him remember that very happy time as well. So what new relationships can you build here at church and in the community? When you're in the coffee hour, can you talk to someone you don't know well? Instead of going up to the friends that you know best, go up to someone you don't know as well, maybe, and, and get a conversation started. Listen to the Spirit and let the Spirit guide you. But you'll be surprised what God can do with simple conversation like Paul and Silas and Timothy and Lydia. And I hope some of those other women, too, we hear Lydia's response. I hope some other women there by the river who are praying also, if they didn't respond right away with Lydia, maybe they went to her house later too. And maybe she shared the faith with them and then they came to an experience of faith. We can hope that that happened for them, right? It always happens in God's timing. And now I invite you to pray with me. Oh God, thank you for the many ways that you minister to each of us and the ways that you used Paul, Silas, Timothy, Peter, all of the early leaders of the church. Each was called to a different place, different role. But you took Paul and you turned him around so much from when he was persecuting Christians to becoming someone who could sit down and talk about Jesus with others. And someone who said that nothing mattered to him but his faith, that everything else was rubbish. That is powerful. So we pray that you would work with power in our lives. None of us is perfect. We, we feel so inadequate sometimes as your disciples and your messengers. But you've always worked through ordinary human beings, and we ask you to work through us. In Jesus' name, amen.